Okay, this evening we're going to be talking about the proper Christian response to governmental tyranny. Government working within its rightful lane is a tremendous blessing. To put it simply, such a government promotes human flourishing and refrains from tyrannical behavior. A case in point is the Alabama government this past spring and summer. It initially was heavy-handed toward religion in its COVID response regarding religious freedom. And then enough of us pointed out that religious restrictions were unconstitutional, that they got back in their lane and stopped being unconstitutional. But what we need to talk about now is the appropriate Christian response to governmental tyranny. There are a variety of different angles to view the subject of, of tyranny. From number one, it's begin with Fox's Book of Martyrs. All the apostles except John were executed for disobedience to the government. And they tried to execute him in boiling oil, but the oil didn't harm him. So blind obedience to government is obviously not appropriate. Number two, an applicable passage is Paul's words on government. And this is Romans 13, 1 through 7. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed, and those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is an authority? Then do what is good, and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, one must be in subjection, not only to avoid God's wrath, but also for the sake of conscience. For because of this, you also pay taxes. For the authorities are ministers of God attending to this very thing. Pay to all what is owed to them. Taxes to whom taxes are owed. Revenue to whom revenue is owed, respect to whom respect is owed, honor to whom honor is owed. But this passage can't be a comprehensive view because, once again, all the apostles but one was executed for disobedience to government, as mentioned above. So blind obedience is obviously inappropriate. But it appears to me that after careful reading of that passage that Paul very cleverly sowed the seeds for disobedience to government in this passage on obedience to government. These letters were being passed around the Roman Empire and could easily fall into imperial hands. So I think Paul had to write carefully. So in verse 3, what if the rulers are a terror to good conduct? In verse 4, what if the ruler carries out Satan's wrath on the right doer? That's obviously where obedience ends. Doing either of those things makes the magistrate a tyrant. Our first appeal when confronted with a tyrant is to lesser magistrates, such as governors and mayors and sheriffs and judges. Their duty would be to oppose and cancel the effects of the tyrannical greater magistrate. If they refuse, or they're cowardly, or they're eliminated by the tyrant, then the people must deal with the tyrant and his henchmen. Number three, another applicable passage is Christ's words on self-defense. Matthew 24, 43 says, But know this, that if the master of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have let his house be broken into. And its parallel passage in Luke 12, 39 but know this, that if the master of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have left his house to be broken into. Parables can be thought to contain timeless truisms or common sense. In this case, Christ was setting forth the obvious principle that people have the right to defend life and property. And he did it in such an offhand way that he was obviously expressing timeless common sense that how else could the master of the house prevent the thief from doing his will? The context of turn the other cheek is therefore obviously speaking of slights and insults, 
not existential threats from criminals, so that doesn't apply. Another question we must ask ourselves, is the military an appropriate vocation or profession for Christians? If we answer yes, we need to understand that the whole purpose of the military is to kill people and break things. And every job in the military involves either being a shooter or in some way helping the shooter kill more efficiently. The military is essentially national self-defense or self-defense writ large. If it's appropriate for Christians to serve in the military and defend the country, it's appropriate for Christians to defend themselves. Number four, what were the bases for the American Revolution? Understanding the bases for the American Revolution can be instructive in this study of the biblical response to tyranny. Our founders rebelled against the British government. The two primary bases for the rebellion was that ours was a war against tyranny, and that ours was a defensive war since we did not fire the first shot, and scripture supports self-defense as shown above. It's obvious from the writings at the time that the American people didn't feel they were on the wrong side of God during the revolution. And American clergy were at the forefront of the war. In fact, when the British captured American clergy, they tortured them mercilessly, much more than they would a regular soldier, because they knew the great sway the clergy had in helping bring, and in many cases, lead congregations into this fight against tyranny. In fact, the British called the American clergy the black-robed regiment because of their strong opposition to tyrannical British rule. Other issues included that men are created in the image of God and therefore have certain unalienable rights, among these being life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and that rulers receive their authority from God. But when the ruler and God come into con conflict, the righteous have a duty to obey God rather than men. In fact, one of the mottos of the Revolutionary War was, resistance to tyrants is obedience to God. Another wrinkle is the many times Providence intervened to aid the fledgling Continental Army just in the nick of time. God doesn't miraculously bless sin. He may passively allow things to happen, but he wouldn't supernaturally intervene to help a cause unless that cause was just. Number four, another facet is the law. The, co the Constitution isn't a musty, old, irrelevant document, but instead it's the supreme law of the United States. In essence, it's not scripture, but it's our secular king. Our ruler isn't a governmental magistrate like a president who takes office under the Constitution's authority. Those mass magistrates must swear to support and defend the Constitution, the king, before they can take office. In other words, they must swear obedience to that king. Those who attempt to ignore or oppose this supreme law while acting as governmental magistrates are brazen criminals. They're flouting and opposing the Constitution, illegally trying to overthrow that rightful secular king. In fact, the laws Christians are required to obey flow through God to the Constitution, to the governmental magistrates. Governmental magistrate laws that oppo oppose God's law are not to be obeyed. And for that matter, constitutional laws that oppose God's laws are not to be obeyed. Thankfully, our founders created a constitution that's not in opposition to God's laws, so that's not an issue. But we could well face governmental magistrate laws that oppose God's law. And we're under no obligation to obey those laws. In fact, as mentioned above, our founders believe that resistance to tyrants is obedience to God. A significant law that Justice Story, an early Supreme Court justice, said is the palladium of liberty is the Second Amendment of the Constitution. This palladium of liberty is a liberty upon which all other liberties, including religious liberty, can be defended. This liberty is the right to keep and bear arms. Our founders wisely included this liberty as part of our king, our constitution, and made it difficult to amend or eliminate. So if a governmental magistrate tries to confiscate weapons, he's nothing but a thief and a tyrant, and obviously desiring greater tyranny. And he's brazenly trying to overthrow the king, our constitution, 
and violating his oath of obedience. Because if these thieves and tyrants do confiscate our means of self-defense, we have no recourse to stop further magistrate tyranny, nor even other common criminal tyranny. Such an act also furthers anarchy, because when guns are outlawed, only outlaws will have guns. This, of course, would bring human flourishing to a screeching halt. Any government that supports such anarchy isn't a government worthy of support. A tyrant, especially a magistrate that tries to overthrow the king, the Constitution, is just a criminal writ large and should no more be obeyed than any other common thief or murderer. The Second Amendment is therefore an anti-tyranny law, allowing us to prevent and deal with tyrants and thieves, great and small. Its text reads, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. And no, the Supreme Court isn't the ultimate decider of the law. Many on the left claim that the Second Amendment doesn't confer an individual right to keep and bear arms. This is rather puzzling given the fact that uh, over 400 million arms are in private hands of citizens in the United States. All those hundreds of millions of guns owned by Americans over the years wasn't some sort of accident. There has also been talk of packing the court by adding enough additional justices to make all decisions come out the way the left wants them to. That's a tyrannical act all by itself, if they succeed. But that's not the only reason the Supreme Court isn't the ultimate decider of the law. There's also the fact that we can read what our king, the Constitution, says. The text of the Second Amendment itself, with the operative phrase, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed, makes it pretty plain. As mentioned above, Justice Story didn't call the Second Amendment the palladium of liberty for nothing. It's the ultimate safety valve if our government becomes tyrannical. What many don't understand is that the militia referenced in the Second Amendment is every able-bodied man between the ages of 17 and 45. This is spelled out in the United States Code, enacted as a law of the land. So the militia isn't the National Guard of some claim. And well-regulated can mean things like trying to use common calibers of weapons, being able to hit what is aimed at, etc. And in these days, when millions of young men have spent time in Iraq or Afghanistan over the past generation, they would have a commonality of tactics and discipline as well, and would certainly qualify them as the militia under an even more stringent definition. Even if the founders' vision of a well-regulated militia was of men practicing marching and shooting on the village green each week, in other words, in other words, if the concept of a well-regulated militia changed over the centuries, that doesn't change the fact that the operative clause of the Second Amendment is the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Once again, the hundreds of millions of guns now in the hands of U.S. citizens wasn't some sort of accident or mistake. The Federalist Papers and other writings of the founders make this clear. On the contrary, the Second Amendment is intended to help Americans deal with tyrants personally, if necessary. Tyranny can take the form of the criminal writ small, such as small-time thieves and murderers, or criminals writ large, such as foreign invaders and even, ultimately, domestic tyrants who try to overthrow our king, the Constitution. Literally millions of times per year, Americans prevent the petty criminal from tyrannizing them by using the guns the left doesn't want us to keep and bear. This prevention can take the form of killing them, wounding them, or even just brandishing them to scare the would-be tyrants away, depending on the level of the threat. And these millions of life-saving incidents dramatically outweigh the number of murders committed by criminals with guns each year. Since those numbers of murders would be hundreds of times higher without the means to protect ourselves. Also, two significant examples of repelling foreign invaders come to mind from as recently as World War II. A quote attributed to Japanese Admiral Yamamoto was that the USA should not be invaded because there would be a gun behind every blade of grass. 
He attended Harvard and was Japanese naval attache to the USA twice. So even if this isn't an exact quote, it certainly expressed his sentiments from his firsthand knowledge of Americans and how widespread gun ownership was. Another example is that during the war, men too young or too old for military service were asked to man checkpoints near the coast and asked to bring their own guns to try to catch spies. At least some German spies put ashore by U-boats were caught this way and were turned over to authorities and imprisoned and or executed. Another silly leftist argument is that the Second Amendment only intends Americans to have muzzle-loading muskets, since all, that's all the founders had available. Their hypocrisy is plain because leftists exercise their First Amendment's free speech right by writing this very argument on computers and the internet that also didn't exist at our founding. So only if they wrote this argument using a quill on parchment and then sent it to the publisher via a postman on horseback and the publisher only used an antique printing press and distributed the writing by postman on horseback would I take them seriously. On the contrary, it's plain that our founders intended Americans to have weapons up to the challenge of repelling all forms of tyranny. That requires Americans to keep up with the weapons technology of whatever era we find ourselves in because once again, the Second Amendment is the ultimate constitutional check and balance when all other checks and balances fail. And leftists also try to claim this ultimate constitutional check and balance is irrational given the fact that the domestic tyrant would have nukes. Vietnam and Afghanistan proved that a determined insurgency can successfully oppose a nuclear superpower. With several hundred million firearms and trillions of rounds of ammunition in the hands of private U.S. citizens, we'd be in a far better position to prevent tyranny than either of those two countries. We just need the backbone to do what needs to be done. Uh, number six, some scripture passages that seem to be of the opposing view, that those who t take the sword will perish by the sword. Matthew 26, 52 says, Then Jesus said to him, Put your sword back into its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. But then its parallel passage has a different theme, that he came to do the Father's will. John eighteen eleven says, So Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword into its sheath. Shall not, I not drink the cup that the Father has given me? But even Matthew 26, 52 doesn't forbid action. Christ warned if we take up weapons, we could be killed by weapons, which is sort of a given. On the other hand, if we don't take up weapons, we could still be killed by weapons for that matter, especially where a tyrant is concerned. Christ could have also been warning against the offensive action that Peter took in the Garden of Gethsemane, lopping off the ear of one of the mob coming for Jesus. This might be one of the reasons the founders insisted theirs was a defensive struggle against British tyranny. The arguments above support the founders' view of Romans 13, which I have read above. There were other articles that agreed with people like John MacArthur in condemning the American Revolution. But I don't think their argument is logical, primarily because they don't take into account the consequences of the view that resistance to tyrants is obedience to God, nor the two exceptions that Paul wrote right into the text of Romans 13. In fact, an easy case can be made that a tyrannical magistrate in this country is a domestic enemy of the Constitution, the King. A part of the oath that all military members take is that we will support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. If things become dire and we become embroiled in a civil war, that's exactly how they should be treated. In any case of tyranny, the government will have gone so far outside their lane that they're no longer recognizable as a legitimate government having willfully breached and flouted their duty to support and defend the king, their constitution, they swore to support and defend themselves. Christians in such a situation would need to strive to see that legitimate government is restored. I hope this talk 
has at least given us food for thought. We fervently hope and pray that things don't become dire and that God will continue to bless this nation, however undeservedly. But to quote Second Chronicles 7.14, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Uh, and I'm going to hold any questions for later. Uh, Brandon's actually going to be teaching on this a couple times in January. So with all of this in mind, I'd like to call on uh, Brian to lead us in prayer for our nation and for the courage of lesser magistrates to do what may be required of them. Father God, we thank you say that Jesus is king, that is a political statement. Father, you are Lord of heaven and Lord of earth. And your rule is just and righteous and perfect and good. And Father, anyone who falls under your rule uh, as a leader um, is in their right position. And Father, we know that anybody who steps out from under your perfect rule and does things whimsically or on their own uh, Father, it is when tyranny begins. So, Father, I pray um, that sheriffs and judges and mayors and governors and anybody that's in a position uh, that you've put them in, when they see and sense the injustice of what's going on and that tyranny is happening and that the Constitution, uh, which is the, the, the king uh, of our land, earthly king of our land, um, as it's in submission to you, as they see the assault on the Constitution, Father, that they would do uh, as Justice Roy Moore has done and say no. <coughs> Give them courage, Lord. Um, it's not, no one's required to be shot in that. There's no bloodshed. Uh, it's simply them using the power that's been given to them, granted to them through um, boats and, and any other way they got there, Lord, uh, to just say no. And Father, that takes tremendous courage. And so, Father, that's what we're praying for. We pray for these lesser magistrates to have tremendous courage, filled with the Spirit, that they would be bold, that they would be brazen, that they would have the type of courage that would go down in the history books, Father, a uh, hundred or maybe a thousand years from now, uh, when they look back on what happened in 2020, Father, that people would go down in history uh, because of their courage to stand against uh, this onslaught of wickedness that's coming in our country. Father, I pray for our nation. I pray for the United States of America, Father. Um, it's my belief that we are a, a covenant nation, Lord. And, and Father, we are, um, as a nation, um, out of fellowship with you as we continue to be unfaithful to the covenant you made with us. And Lord, I pray uh, that as uh, Lon quoted in 2 Chronicles seven fourteen, that we would be a nation that would um, come to our knees and repent and cry out. Um, and confess our wickedness, our waywardness, um, uh, as the, the word calls it, uh, the whoring um, and the prostitution, Father, as we uh, pursue other things than, than you, the one true God. Well, I pray that our nation would, would repent, uh, confess their, their sins, and, and that we would be restored. And Father, that we would once again be a city on a hill, Father, that we would, um, we, that, that we would also um, from that repentance that we would go forward expanding the bounds of your kingdom in every square inch of this earth uh, and placing your enemies under your footstool under your feet as a footstool Lord help us to do that um, help us also understand that the simplest way to do all those things I just said is to be faithful to be faithful where we are to be faithful in our relationship with you to be faithful in our relationship with our spouses to be faithful in our relationship with our children to our homes to our communities. And Father, as we, as we do that, uh, your kingdom will go forth, and we pray that it would. In Christ's name, amen. amen.